we got to really get organized if we're going to have a future. And so we're going to talk about that uh, uh, quite a bit, about the different organizing models that people are working on in terms of trying to really bring uh, the question of local renewable power to be something real. Uh, it takes a lot of political pressure. It takes building a huge constituency. We really need to have at the core of that activity uh, people, organizations, uh, parts of our population that are most committed and have the most at stake. And that's everybody in this room, really. That's who we're talking about here. So what we want to do is we want to hear from some of those folks who've been right at the front line of organizing about some of the models and the ways they think about organizing. Without any further ado, I want to uh, introduce Niall Malloy from the Communities for a Better Environment, Northern California director, uh, colleague of the Local Clean Energy Alliance, who worked closely and uh, asked him to, to, uh, to moderate this session because he has such great experience in terms of working in our communities uh, and around organizing and development. Well, how's everyone doing? Good, good afternoon. So before we even get started, I want everybody to stand up and just stretch a little bit. And just go left and right a little bit, left and right. More to the left, more to the left. <laughs> All right. I just want to do that a little bit so you can have a seat. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that feels pretty good, right? Um, so I am, have been really impressed about what I heard thus far in the conference and particularly around all the great work that we are all doing. This is a movement that's really going to have, uh, that we all been a part of, that's really going to make effective change. And I think what's critical right now that we've identified throughout this conference is that we need to be engaging residents and everyday people in the conversation that we're having. Uh, we're in the middle of Oakland, and look how many people are here. We need to have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people really committed to this work. So I'm really excited about this panel because, you know, organizing for, to, to democratize energy really takes community leadership, um, community vision, and also um, their commitment to really explore the actual historical issues around pollution, um, the crisis around climate, around health issues and equities, and really apply it to really looking at how we look at changing this economic structure um, that includes energy as one in the forefront of what we need to be doing. So I'm going to actually have a very ex exciting panel of um, different um, leading organizations and a little bit more about my organization, um, Communities for a Better Environment. You know, we're a statewide environmental health and justice organization. We're based in Northern California and Southern California. And we've been committed to uh, clean energy work w through a lot of different avenues, um, looking at pollution prevention, but also clean energy. Uh, with some of the key work with the um, California Environmental Justice Alliance, with some of our key stakeholders are in the room like APEN and um, uh, Poder, several other organizations that's really committed to working collectively. Or how can we move state legislation to really support low-income um, communities that has been adversely impacted by the toxic pollution um, in our communities? And so we've been committed to kind of push several levels, um, looking at um, state legislation, looking at, um, looking at pushing the PUC, and also looking on the local level, which I think that's where a lot of our, our core bases are at. So one example, I want to, well, two examples um, about our work has been really linked, to, linked through um, organizing what, you know, Tom Steyer just mentioned. You know, when we actually pushed the fight against Prop 23, it took the community-based organization actually to move the goalpost to make that a strong victory for all of us, right? Because it took African-American, API, Latino voices to really commit to that struggle to really make to move it to make that happen. So that was actually a real victory where we actually collectively came together and won that. So let's get that a round of applause. Um, um, the other thing, he mentioned Prop 39. Now, Prop 39, a lot of the same EJ groups that worked on Prop 23 actually committed through down on that, actually pushed, got our memberships involved to get, get the votes that are actually ne necessary to win that as well. It was actually kind of like a landslide of results um, because it was like it was a no-brainer. But it's really critical that that actually built some civic engagement, some voter mobilization, and some muscle around communities really looking at how do they take power through that electoral process, through the process of civic engagement. So that's a really critical strategy that I think has been beneficial to the organizing and also looking at scale of getting a lot of people more involved, not only 
uh, our existing membership, but the broader memberships of the residents involved. So we're looking at game-changing strategies. Uh, one lab, um, strategy that we've been working on here in Oakland, um, a strategy looking at the Oakland Climate Action Coalition, which actually is a coalition of 40 plus stakeholders, labor, businesses, and others, that came together to push the Energy and Climate Action Plan in the city of Oakland. Um, how many people actually was involved with that? How many people in the OCAC are here? Oakland Climate, all right? So that was another kind of model in which we got a lot of different organizations, stakeholders to push some local policy. And what we end up having is that it was a policy, a successful victory in terms of we got a lot of the policies we wanted, we got a lot of the momentum, but at the end of the day, we didn't have the resources to implement it. Because we got the policy passed, no resources to implement it. So a lot of us are still working on ensuring for the city of Oakland, how do we look at resources to implement a strategy around clean energy as one of the, uh, the key points is, but also urban agriculture, um, looking at um, climate adaptation, resilience based of work, um, and, uh, and transportation and, and land use. So all these different areas of work were actually a part of the driver of the Energy Climate Action Plan. That's another model of how collectively we can move some plans and policies to the table, which actually had a huge organizing component of leadership development, engaging our membership. So organizing for d this d democratic energy is um, pretty much, it's going to be the lifeblood um, of many of our memberships really being committed to this work and really also sharing their expertise of how we actually move it. So we have um, four panelists that's actually going to give more of their expertise and experience about working on these various issues. Our first presenter is going to be Alan Hernandez. Um, he's an or organizer at Sierra Club's My Generation campaign. And Alan has done work with CB in Southern California around just kind of how to get young people really excited about this democratizing energy, looking at climate change issues, looking at how it's going to actually, what are the solutions on the ground that young people actually can play a leadership role on. The focus of the My Generation campaign to bring more clean energy to California with an emphasis on low-income communities, like the communities of the Inland Empire, and communities of color. Um, and I've added another component there, young people. We got this three-prong approach um, that we use to like, try to affect clean energy policy. Um, first one is obviously where you always have to start in community. Um, you have to build power, uh, base building, coalition building, leadership development. Um, and we've been able to do that. Um, we form coalitions with uh, one of the community groups, the Chicano Indigenous uh, Community for Culturally uh, Advocacy and Action, Chica. Um, long acronym, right? Um, but it's a cultural center in there. We've uh, formed alliances with the Occupy movement out there. Um, we've worked a lot with a lot of the universities, a lot of the colleges, uh, nonprofits, like, for example, Grid Alternatives. We work really closely with them. Uh, we worked uh, with the assembly members, with the congressmen. We have worked with the churches. Um, we've worked with uh, the solar industry, Varengo, Solar City, Sunrun. You name it, we've brought them in, right? And we understand that if we are to win, we need to bring together a very strong coalition, one that's ready to throw down on these policies. Um, along with that, we also build our base, right? If It's like what Tom said, you're not going to do anything if you don't get the community involved. And so we've been bringing in young people mainly, uh, a lot of them from the community colleges. Um, uh, and for those people who say like those students at community colleges don't care, they really do. Actually, a lot of times more than uh, our students at the, in the UC system, uh, at the private schools. Uh, and that was really interesting to see because we never expected that. Um, but one of the things like we really, that we've been focusing on is developing those leaders um, and we're at a point where I don't strain myself, but that they do the organizing um, and that each one takes a little bit of organizing. I used to be a labor organizer before I did this, and so we worked on the shop steward model where the shop stewards uh, took the message into the shop and organized the shop for you and brought it out. And so my job is more that of a coordinator. Um, and so I, I had this philosophy where I don't really want to tell you about what we've done. I'd rather have like the papers tell like the community, what we've done, tell our local electeds. This headline rings, uh, reads, San Marino Valley College student leads organizing campaign for environmental justice. Local paper profiled one of our activists uh, and all her amazing work. She has now gone on to Austin to work on our Beyond Coal campaign out there. Um, another one profiles an activist who wants to work in the barrios. 
uh, and bring up young people, uh, take them off the streets, take them out of gangs, uh, and get them involved in the media arts. He was able to really sharpen his skill through the My Generation campaign. And if you get one of these blue things, you'll see how he talks about how he wants to incorporate that with his work with the Sierra Club. Uh, he went to the Good Jobs, Green Jobs conference, changed his life. Uh, a lot of our cam campaign is built on investing in our activists. Um, you invest in one good activist, you have that one-on-one -on -one meeting, you meet with them weekly. Um, again, the union model, if there's an action to do, that one activist is gonna turn out 10 to 20 people. And you invest in about five or six, before you know it, you got this march of 60 people that you've organized in a week and a half. And so we do a lot of base building, uh, leadership development. What else do we do? Well, we understand, like Tom said, it's political. We need to talk, influence our politicians. What did Tom say was the number one thing that people are talking about right now? Jobs. So this says, Assembly Member Cheryl Brown to host Green Collar Jobs event. Guess who was one of the event coordinators? The Sierra Club My Generation campaign. We have been working on the Assembly Member for a long time. Uh, collecting petitions in her district, showing her that we have clout in her district. Uh, we came to her office, spread them out on her desk, about 700 petitions, said these are all people who vote for you or who could potentially vote for you, and we've got them. And so she said, what do you want to do? We worked with Grid Alternatives um, and the local solar companies. And if you know anything about the Inland Valley, it's probably the number one solar market in California. And so... Um, a lot of potential, a lot of jobs. Uh, we held a jobs event, um, big success, 300 people showed up. We just held one last week uh, with the congressman, Raul Reese. We packed out the place again. Um, politicians like this, and so we figure that out, and we form coalitions to really expose that. We also need to take on our utility company. Uh, Southern California Edison, we feel, is really getting in the way of this. And so, again, we have the paper talking about how we've taken them on. Um, we actually occupied their lobby uh, not too long ago, and you guys are gonna see that video. Um, um, they placed the building on lockdown, they freaked out, they funneled everyone outside the secret gate. Um, they freaked out, and ultimately, uh, we made them talk to us, negotiate with us, uh, push them to hold meetings and everything, uh, and they had to negotiate with young people, they hated that. Um, they, they were respecting a suit and tie from our part, but they got young people. I'm Susanna Churchill. I am um, the California Distributed Solar Advocate with Vote Solar. Just for those of you who don't um, know my organization, we're a nonprofit advocacy organization that works to remove the barriers to the growth of solar energy in states all over the country. Um, so we are, you know, we work closely with the solar industry, but we are funded like an environmental nonprofit. And we work on a range of different campaigns to help to grow both large scale and distributed solar. And one of our main priorities in recent years, it's going to continue to be a priority, has been our efforts to defend net metering policies in states across the country. So I just want to talk a little bit about our, our net metering work and our constituency building um, within that context. So just as I get started, when I say net metering, how many of you know basically what that means? Okay, good. So I think that's, this is a very unusual group then because the average Joe does not know what net metering is. But just, just so, so I'm defining it one more time. So net metering is, is the policy that allows you as a solar customer, if you put solar on your home or business, when that solar array is generating more power than you're actually using, um, to export that energy back to the grid so that your neighbors can buy it. And it gives you fair and full credit on your energy bill for that clean, extra clean energy. So it allows your meter, your electric meter, to actually spin backwards and save you energy. And um, I think many people just see this as a common sense thing. Well, if you've invested a lot of your money in a rooftop solar array and it's generating clean energy that's going back onto the grid, why shouldn't you get full credit for that clean energy? But 
topic has actually gotten very controversial in recent years. The Many of the big utilities have been attacking net metering and claiming that it's shifting costs between different types of um, electric customers. And they've been going to legislatures and commissions around the country asking policymakers to basically roll back the policy. And net metering is in place in 43 states and D.C. right now, but we've been having to wage a lot of battles in defense to keep uh, to keep it on the books as as a policy, um, some recent battle main battleground states have been here: California, Arizona, Idaho, Louisiana, and of course, you know the utilities are very formidable opponents. They have armies of lobbyists. They have lots of money for campaign contributions. They've really been getting in there with the policymakers and making this argument that this policy is unfair, and so. We've we've been successful so far in our efforts um, and kept the policy in place, but it's going to be much more of the same in coming years. Um, you know, and, and I think a big part of this, our effort has been in seeking to reframe the issue. So the utilities try to talk about net metering like this. Most solar customers are wealthy people, and when they put solar on their roof and they get credit for the exports, they're basically paying less on their utility bills, and so they're shifting the cost, the fixed costs associated with the grid onto other customers. And who are those other customers? Those are poor people. And so this is rich people with solar shifting costs onto poor people. It's not fair and we should get rid of net metering. Um, and then they also want to get very technical and in the weeds about, let's talk about exactly what the costs and the benefits are associated with net metering. Let's you know vastly underestimate the benefits and overstate the costs and get everybody all confused. And then maybe policymakers will think, well, you know, this has to be unfair. So we've been defending net metering on, on several fronts. So first, we have been duking it out in a very sort of wonky cost-benefit analysis context in commissions across the country, trying to make sure that these analyses are, are, are designed correctly so that we're actually going to get, um, cause, because commission makers do want to look, commissioners do want to understand the costs and the benefits. So that's been one part of our, our work. Our second strategy has been reframing the message and messaging in the media about why net metering and other policies that uh, benefit rooftop solar, benefit everybody, not just the people that put solar on their roofs. And also being very pointed in the media and elsewhere about turning it around on the utilities. Why exactly are the utilities suddenly so concerned about cost shifts between customer classes? This is something that happens all the time. It's because they're afraid of rooftop solar. Rooftop solar is getting cheaper. It's threatening their outdated business model. And this is an attack on trying to stop the inevitable growth of rooftop solar. And that's actually been quite effective because I think a lot of people get that. Oh, yeah, this, that's really what the utilities are doing here. And then the third strategy has been using public comment making processes to show legislators and commissioners that there's really broad public support for protecting net metering and making it clear to them this is not just a wonky issue that only a few people are paying attention to. If you roll back net metering, you're harming rooftop solar and that's very politically unpopular and people are paying attention. So I'm gonna talk mostly about that that third piece. Um, you know, it's it's not, luckily for us, it has not been very difficult to build a broad coalition in defense of net metering because a lot of different groups see clearly why net metering and rooftop solar is so important to their causes. So, you know, we, we need this to be an argument that's not just the utilities versus the solar, the solar industry. Um, we're not going to win that way. So we've been highlighting different key messages and bringing in different constituencies um, to help us reinforce those messages. So the first message, of course, is rooftop solar means cleaner air and it means local jobs. And so we've done a lot of mobilizing of environmental, public health, and, and environmental justice groups. Um, when in 2012, we worked at the, the California Public Utilities Commission, had a big decision to make about how to define the size of the program cap for net metering. And we organized a series of letters um, to commissioners with a broad range of public health, EJ, and environmental stakeholders talking about the clean air and public health and jobs benefits of defining the program cap in the right way. 
Um, we also mobilized a whole lot of uh, public comments directly to the commission. So we got tens of thousands of public comments in uh, at the right time. I believe it was the most comments that the CPUC had ever seen on any topic. So we really made it clear, you know, this is something people are paying attention to and they and they care about. Um, second, you know, aside from the clean air and jobs benefits, you've got the benefit that net metering allows people to save big on their energy bills. And you already have a lot of powerful entities doing that. So we have brought in a lot of large energy users who have already gone solar or want to go solar to bring their voices into the into the fray. So for example, um, in California at the CPUC, we had the California Farm Bureau Association, the California Building Industries Association um, weighing in at the PUC. Uh, we had schools and government agencies. Uh, many schools and local governments are saving a lot of money um, by going solar. So they were um, active and vocal. And I know that Environment California and, and a number of other folks are doing some really good work um, to get mayors and other local leaders even more involved in, in campaigns to um, enable the growth of rooftop. And then, you know, there's this other message uh, that rings, I think, true with a different set of, of folks, which is, aside from you can save on your utility bills, it's a free market message. It's con energy consumers should have the right to opt out of what the utilities want to sell them. They should be able to opt out of this monopoly model. They should be able to generate their own clean energy if they want to, and they should get fair credit for the clean energy that they're sending back to the grid. And um, that message has really resonated in, you know, especially in more conservative places like Arizona and the South. Um, and it's great because we're starting to see more free market oriented groups coming out in support of solar and rooftop solar. So you guys might have read a few months ago in Georgia, um, some tea par a significant faction of the Tea Party there came out and said they were in favor of, of solar as a free market um, policy. And they were really instrumental in getting the commission in Georgia to vote to require the big utility there to buy a whole lot more solar. So I'm hoping we're going to see more of that as time goes on. Conservative groups sort of willing to break from the Republican um, anti-renewable messaging on this. Um, so I think that's largely it for me. I, you know, I, I just a couple of the key takeaways for other local um, clean energy campaigns going forward, I would say, you know, keep hammering on the simple messages about why rooftop solar and distributed clean energy makes sense. Don't let your opponents frame the debate and get into the weeds and um, talk about it in a way that um, talk about it in a way that is going to resonate with a lot of people and keep it simple. And then the second takeaway is, you know, just think creatively about all the different stakeholders that have an interest here and work to bring them in and get them activated and get their voices um, contacting the decision makers at the right time. So I think I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you, Susanna. So I'm going to actually um, bring up our next presenter, um, Woody Hastings, um, who is the Renewable Energy Implementation Manager at the Climate Protection Campaign. And Woody just remind me in the hallway, he used to work at CB a while ago, so that's interesting. Um, and in this capacity, Woody helps to lead efforts to advance local renewable energy. So let's inv um, invite Woody up to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Niall, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, yes, my name is Woody Hastings. I work with the Climate Protection Campaign. Uh, we are, are just concluded uh, what for me has been a, a little over three-year uh, campaign, uh, and for the Climate Protection Campaign, uh, initiated the idea of Community Choice Energy in Sonoma County in 2005, so eight-year campaign. And I'm happy to say that as of July, this past July, Sonoma County has a new local energy provider, load-serving load entity, the Sonoma Clean Power Authority. What I'm mostly going to talk about um, is, the, is the campaign from an organizing perspective. We do urge other communities throughout the state to consider community choice energy as an option for accelerating uh, energy efficiency and local 
renewable energy deployment and thereby uh, accelerate greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Um, it's great that we're going after uh, lunch because you're all in a food coma right now, right? <laughs> and one of the points I want to make is that the U.S. is really in sort of this fossil fuel coma, right? I mean, we just do all this stuff and we have all this energy and we just drive around and flip the switch and the lights come on and just no problem at all, right? And so we're all just sort of complacent and we are in what I would consider a fossil fuel coma and have been for a long time. And there is a problem because there are problems. And so some of those problems is that, as we all know in this room, uh, dirty, damaging, finite, vulnerable, um, and closed off to regular people. Let's remember this is about people uh, and making the world a better place for people to live in. And so it is for the benefit of a very few people the way the current construct is. And we believe that local uh, energy development can bring in more opportunities for more people. Susanna mentioned it. We're a rare bunch. We just concluded this conversation about our electricity system in Sonoma County. And people don't talk about it. <laughs> they, they don't. And so the reason I'm mentioning that is because there's a steep learning curve. People aren't, you know, what? You know, what are we going to talk about this? And we get got it all the time. What's broken? So something else um, I want to touch on is defining democratize. When we talk about democratizing energy, what does that actually really mean? What would that look like? The democratization of energy would mean that it's, 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 it's localized and there's local control of decision making. Public participation. It's not democracy if, uh, it's not democracy if people aren't participating. Uh, and introduction of consumer choice, basic tenet. Um, we don't currently have it in the monopoly paradigm that we exist under uh, for electricity. Um, opening up increased diverse private sector opportunity. Uh, and we feel that it really won't be democratized until each of us can buy, sell, and trade energy in real time. And that's what's coming with this transformation underway in, in, in energy. Uh, some of the short-term and long-term goals of the campaign, short-term was to establish a CCA, which check, we did that, um, with local build, a local build in the DNA of, of the program. Long-term, democratized, 100% local clean energy, technically feasible, we can do that. Uh, and islandable, meaning that we can detach from the from the uh, larger grid if we want to, but not necessary to do that. And exporting surplus clean power sounds sounds like. And, and when would we get there? It's not going to be right away. It's going to take some time, but we're going to get there. Um, political strategy. Don't make it political. That was advice early on from our political advisors, meaning this is a universal thing. We're just talking about Georgia, uh, you know, and the, the sort of convergence from, from both sides of the political spectrum where there's an interest in security and in uh, local control and in private sector opportunity. Um, and that converges with the environment when, when um, so, so it's a universal thing. And so it's not right or left or Democrat or Republican. So, and we didn't. We talked about um, some of the other aspects of this organizing the strategic organizing plan to uh, bring in stakeholders that stand to benefit from having local uh, clean energy um, and boiling down the message to some simple themes of local communities having the voice i see that um, having a choice about your electricity supply and the local economic benefit um, and then some steps of what you want to do if you're going to pursue a community choice energy program in particular, but perhaps it translates for other campaigns. Figure out why you're doing it and, and don't forget that. Stick to it. And in our case, it was for the climate protection campaign, greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Um, but the co-benefits uh, really helped quite a bit. Um, education and more education. Uh, just keep going. You can't do too much education. Identify your political champions. Um, power map the decision makers, uh, very important. Um, build stakeholder support from labor, business, community, environmental, uh, uh, and the general community. Um, some of the challenges, uh, certainly for, for any one of these campaigns, startup money. Um, it's a complex, confusing issue. Resistance to change. 
perceived risk and the investor-owned utilities and their, their surrogates. That's really translating not so much of just stop, don't do this. It's turning into, it's evolving to be, and we think it's actually a good thing, competition. They're trying to outgreen us now. That's fine. That's great. Um, some, some lessons learned. And it's true. We've actually heard this in some of our colleagues have heard this in meetings where we weren't, they didn't think we were there, but they, they have characterized uh, their, their green tariff, SB 43 as well in the statewide level. Uh, they have characterized that as their response to the rise of CCA in the state of California. Uh, okay, wrapping up. So lessons learned. First decide what you're doing and don't forget it, uh, why you're doing it, um, and uh, Business community support became very paramount. Barry Vesser here in the front row is going to talk a little bit later in one of the workshops about business community support in Sonoma County. It was the wine sector. Um, once you think you've educated someone, do it again. Circle back because you got to make sure you're maintaining the support. They'll, you'll may introduce the thing to them. They'll so say it sounds great, but then they talk to other people and they slip off. So it's, it's important to circle back. Um, and lastly, expect the unexpected. We had all kinds of things happen that we didn't expect, and um, it was um, sort of important, I would say, to anyone moving forward to just don't think it's going to go the way you plan it out to go. Okay? Thank you. So our collective was really formed um, around the understanding that um, we are in the midst of a transition, and who leads that transition will determine how it goes and where we land, okay? So, um, so with that, um, we are a co-anchor and a kind of co-founder along with APEN and CBE and many other groups, Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, of um, the Climate Justice Alliance and now the Our Power Campaign. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, oh, here's my clicker. I'm gonna skip that one. Um, and I want to start by just saying that, you know, really there's two fundamental principles that I believe have to guide our organizing strategies. The first is equity, and the second is we have to transform the economy um, to address the climate crisis. And so, you know, the first premise is really um, that if you want to take care of place, you have to address class, gender, and race. Um, and and that's because social inequity is actually a form of ecological imbalance. And so unless we address inequity, we will not address the climate crisis. And so all of our clean and right, right on, you can clap for that. So it's not simply a like, oh, that's good, that sounds right, it feels good, we know in our hearts that equity is a good thing. It's actually fundamental to our ability to address the crisis that we're in. Um, and so, as many folks have talked about, we need to move from concentration and control to the distribution of resources and power. Um, so, what that looks like is that communities, oh, it didn't, okay. Can, there was like a little, animation. yeah, anime, it's okay. Um, in the background um, um, is, um, well, I'll just say. So communities who are disproportionately impacted, communities who are on the front lines, must therefore lead this transition. And that's essential for two reasons. One is for equity, um, that these communities need to take a leadership role and actually um, gain power in the process of the transformation. And it's also essential because these communities who are struggling to meet needs are actually at the forefront of innovation around cooperation and collaboration and creating the true pathways that we need for the transition. Um, these are just, these are folks from um, the Black Mesa Water Coalition, the Black Mesa Ari uh, Arizona, or the, the reservation in Arizona, Navajo and Diné Reservation, um, at an action that they led in um, Phoenix a few months ago during an Air Power camp that, that they hosted. <clears throat> Thanks. So the second premise is, um, of course, clean energy or the energy sector is 
a strategic point of intervention um, to transform, to, to address the climate crisis. Um, and what's essential about that, this is not only how it's produced or how it's generated, like is it solar, is it fossil fuels, is it nuclear? It's not just that, as many people have said today. It's also about who owns it, but it's also about who, what it's used for. So we know that actually transitioning from an extreme energy system is going to require us to radically transform the rest of the economy, the food system, the waste systems, the water systems, all of these things are only the, the kinds of systems that are in place right now are only possible because of an extreme energy system. And so the two have to go hand in hand. And so, um, and what's also exciting about this is many folks have mentioned um, the fundamental issue of labor and work um, and jobs is that by getting off of an extreme energy system and transforming the economy that we actually are able to create more jobs, more work um, for people. So, um, and there's a great report that Gaia, the Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives put out um, on the waste sector and how transitioning away from incineration and, um, and landfills will actually do this, right? If you transition to zero waste, it puts people to work, it saves money, it cuts greenhouse gas emissions, and we can do this across the, econo the economy. So on these two premises, we formed um, together with 35 networks, alliances, organizations across the country, the Climate Justice Alliance. And so the, really this is about frontline communities leading with a bold vision of remaking economy and democracy to shift the landscape of what's politically possible. So just a sh quick list. You can see the rest of them on the website, um, ourpowercampaign.org. And so we launched um, the, um, the Our Power Campaign with the premise that we actually need powerful movements to shift the landscape. And what we're aiming towards is shutting down the extreme energy economy and transitioning um, to local living economies and that foster community resilience. So this means cities that run on the sun, small scale and, and micro hydro and passive solar and you know, small scale biogas digesters and pedal power, right? So many different forms of locally controlled energy. Cities that know how to grow, short chain and known chain exchange, um, regional food systems. Cities that go with the flow, cities that move in mass, so it's also addressing public transit um, that's appropriate to place, um, and cities that work together, um, community economics where the work is good for us, our communities, and the planet. So this is, oh, actually you can go ahead and skip through all these. These were, yeah, you can see them. There we go. So we launched the campaign in June. Oh, go back a couple. That's okay. We launched the campaign in June of this year um, at the Our Power Camp in Black Mesa, Arizona. Um, we started with three. Hot, we're starting with three hotspots that are home to both um, powerful grassroots organizations like APEN and CBE in Richmond, um, like the Black Mesa Water Coalition in Black Mesa, Arizona, um, and like East Michigan Environmental Action Council in Detroit. So those are the three hot spots. And these are sites also, as folks probably know, of extreme energy um, that are, that are you know, environmental justice communities that have been disproportionately impacted. Um, and um, yeah, so and with sufficient resources, our plan is to build that, build the hot spots out to nine to 12 other place, places by the end of 2014. And so these, um, these hot spots are building coalitions that provide um, critical examples of, not just examples, but really are forging transition, are forging the actual transition that we needed to get the kind of vision that Mia so eloquently put forth this morning. Um, so um, three critical components of this. We're talking about changing the rules, making new, making new rules that create the right kind of conditions and landscape, breaking the rules that are not creating the right conditions in landscape. At the same time that we're moving the resources to the new power economy um, 
at the same time that we're driving folks into new economic institutions that can actually continue to build the political power to foster a just transition. So these, these three things need to happen actually in concert. These three things have been happening sort of, you know, often separately. And what the Our Power campaign and the hotspots are really, are really engaged in doing is doing these things in concert. So continually building our power to foster the transition. Other components of the campaign include a shared narrative strategy. So while groups are um, building out their work at the local level, we're changing the debate from jobs versus the environment to a just transition where everyone can live, a, you know, a better in a better world. Um, <coughs> Uh, convenings that cut across communities. So the gathering in June brought together um, coal impacted communities from across the country as well as others that were experiencing things like fracking where coal was being shut down and fracking was being brought up in its place um, or natural gas was being brought up as a solution to, to stopping coal. So cross um, community gatherings. Um, political education that's shared again across members of different organizations. Um, shared research and strategic national initiatives and the the goal is that over time we're building our power not only to impact the local and regional um, conditions and, and landscape but actually gaining our capacity to shift the federal landscape so that um, we're we're able to pass the kind of policies that shift resources um, out of an extreme energy economy to a just transition all right let's give a round of applause for our panelists I think the critical thing is that organizing and building resilient communities is an essential part of looking at democratizing the energy in the state throughout the country, wherever. And I think the panel really represented that, so I want to give the panel a round of applause. Thank you. And I want to wrap it up by, by doing um, something that I always love doing. And we're just going to do it together. I'm not even going to tell you what it is. So I really want people to really, um, I like the, the value of this um, panel in terms of these essential components. And I think this is going to be really critical as we move forward to really think about how do we engage our communities, our residents, about these really critical issues that's going to really make a difference. So si se puede. Si se puede. Si se puede. Si se puede. Si se puede.